Hello and welcome to this video and today I'm going to be talking about, to you about something rather exciting and that exciting thing is a brand new product that we at Astranti have been working on now for several months and that's a product called an objective test video. Now I'm the E3 tutor at Astranti so what I'm talking to you today about are the E3 objective test videos. But what exactly is an objective test video, I hear you ask? Well, I'll let you know. For every syllabus, E1, E2, 3, E3, P1, P2, P3, F1, F2, F3, we've written 100 questions. And we've divided those 100 questions amongst our chapters. So, for example, in E3, there are 17 chapters. So we've got 100 questions over 17 videos. Now why are we doing it in videos, I hear you ask? Well, the reason is that not only are we going to give you these new questions that you can practice on and perfect your technique for your exam, we are going to talk you through them. So firstly, we're going to give you the representative task statement for every question. Now, what that simply is, it's the area of the syllabus that that question is based upon. It's what SEAM has written. It's what they want you to know and how they expect you to be able to apply it. And we've taken that information and we've turned it into a question just like SEAM will be doing. And then you're going to have the question and we're going to talk through the question showing you the little things that we're going to be looking out for, the things that you have to be aware of. And then through all the different types of questions, we're going to go through the answers and show you how to answer them as effectively and efficiently as you possibly can. So as I said, for E3, we've got 17 chapters. So pretty much we're covering a lot of topics in these 17 videos. And I talk about 100 questions and the 17 videos. And I've told you already that I've spent months working on this project. So what I've got for you in this video is three tips to answering questions based on my experience working on this project products and here we are these are the three tips and the first of these tips is to be careful of the distractors now what exactly do I mean by distractor well it's the things that we put into the questions and the answers to distract you from the real answers and the correct answer now I'm sure well if you're looking at this e3 video you've done a lot of SEMA exams already and you'll know that there's not often a great big distinction between each of the answers and there's a lot of extra information to trip you up. So my first tip is to be very aware of all the ways that SEMA and we are trying to distract you from the right answer. And the first way I will help you be careful of these distractors is through my second tip. And that's to make sure you read the requirement line carefully. Now, I know since you've been taking exams at school, the advice has been to read the question carefully. But we also are aware, aren't we, the time demands of SEMA exams. We're all aware of the pressure of being in one of these SEMA exams. It's very tempting to try and read through these questions as quickly as possible, select an answer as quickly as possible, and move on. So what I'm suggesting here is caution. Now what you'll see in our sample question is that I always look at the requirement line first when I'm about to answer the question okay now actually in our OTV questions I'm going to read you the rep statement first I'm going to give you the context of why we're asking that question but obviously in the real exam you're not going to have the reptile statement so what I'm saying is read the requirement line for carefully and read it first and the reason I tell you to do this is that because if you're reading it first you then return to the scenario you return to all the information of the question and already you're automatically aware of all the little things you should be looking out for all the relevant information and all the information that may be there just to trip you up okay 
So they're my first two tips about reading and analysing the question carefully. Because after all, E3 is pretty much all about analysing the scenario, looking for the correct information, then basing your answer using the correct judgment. But my third tip is something slightly different. It's about thinking about the real world. Now, I know you'll have been doing a lot of it revision for your exams. And you'll be thinking about models and theories and the advantages and disadvantages of them. But actually, what we're thinking about in E3 is how we can use that information to make the best judgments in the real world. It's not just about making academic decisions. We're looking about what would be most effective in the real world. So really, try and put yourself in the position of the scenario. What would you do in real life? Because that's going to help you select the right models and the right theories and get the correct answer. So there we go. There's my three tip based on all of my experience. So what I'm going to do now is show you a example of an OTV question. Now this is from chapter two in E3 and it's all about mission statements. Now mission statements is a pretty easy topic for all you strategic level students. Now what I'm hoping to show you here is how SEMA and we make fairly simple topics trickier and the things you should be looking out for to help guide you to the correct answer. Okay, so let's check out the question. And as I have already said, the first thing we do in these OTV questions is read the reptile statement so that you are aware of the reasons why we're asking you these questions. Okay, in question three, we've got a new syllabus reference for you. Perform or review a Mendelo's matrix analysis to analyze an organization's stakeholders related to their level of interest and power. Okay, and as always, we're going to go down to the requirement line. Insert the appropriate approaches from the section below. So we're inserting the appropriate approaches from the selection below to fill in the blanks based on the position of LWJ stakeholders according to Mendelo's matrix. And importantly, you can use each approach more than once. So we're using Mendelo's matrix here, and we're basing it on the stakeholders that we're going to learn about in the scenario. Okay, so we've just got to extract the correct information. Now, before we go through the scenario, I think it'd be really useful to remind ourselves what Mendelo's matrix actually is. Now, it's a tool that helps an organization identify the relationships that should be built with different stakeholders. Okay, and you'll notice I put should in caps, and that's because this tool kind of ranks the importance of the stakeholders so the state so the organization knows how to deal with those stakeholders and the matrix does this by ranking the stakeholders position over two factors and we've got our two factors here the level of interest and power now power relates to the stakeholders ability to influence the organization and its decision making. And the second factor is interest. Now interest is the amount of interest the stakeholder has in the organization. So this is the interest of the stakeholder in the organization, not the interest of the organization in the stakeholder. Okay, so that's what Mendelo's matrix is and what it does, and that's how it does it, by ranking them through the two factors. Now let's turn our attention back to the scenario. I'll just bring the page down again. So LWJ is a specialist building construction and preservation company that's been commissioned to undertake an 18-month project by BG. So BG has commissioned LWJ to undertake the project. So I'm going to highlight BG there. Um, and LWJ have been commissioned to make repairs to a castle's structure, presumably the BG's 
castle. The castle was open to the public before it fell into disrepair and will be again after the restoration. LWJ has applied for authorization, so LWJ needs authorization from the local building preservation body and has to comply with the body's regulatory standards when it's carrying out the work. Now, for the duration of the project, LWJ has hired several more specially trained construction workers on a temporary basis and assigned its more senior employees to work on it. So we've got different types of employees working on the project, some temporary and some senior who presumably have been at the company a long time. Some of the permanent employees have shown resistance to the move as it is meant putting LWJ's other projects on hold. So you can see we're highlighting all the stakeholders here, everyone that's got an interest in the project or an interest in LWJ as well because obviously we know that we're dealing with Mendelo's Matrix. We know Mendelo's Matrix is about ranking and prioritizing stakeholders. So as we're going through the scenario, that's exactly what we're doing. We're highlighting the stakeholders so we know which ones to use during the answer. And the historians have contacted LWJ expressing interest and support for the project. Okay, then we come back to the requirement line, which we've already talked about. Insert the appropriate approaches from the selection below to fill in the blanks based on the positions of LWJ stakeholders, which we've gone through and highlighted, according to Mendelo's matrix, which we've talked about and understood. And then we should note that we can use each approach more than once. So I'm just scrolling down so we can see every approach. Okay, so now we need to think about the different stakeholders. And the first is BG should be. Okay, so let's give ourselves a bit of a helping hand now. Let's quickly write in or draw in, I should say, a Mendelo's matrix. Okay, so now we can think, I've got a kind of Mendelo's matrix written on the screen for you. We've got power increasing down the side of this part of the matrix and interest increasing on this side of the matrix. Now, BG has obviously employed LJW, so he's going to have high power in the project, isn't he? Because he could, if he wanted, cancel the project or he could change the criteria regarding the project. So he's a really powerful individual when we're thinking about this castle project. And then we've got this interest. And remember, interest is what the stakeholder has in the project. Now, presumably, he's going to have a lot of interest in the project because it's his castle. So he's going to be down in this bottom right-hand corner of the matrix because he's got high power and he's got high influence. Now, this means that he's regarded by Mendelos as a key player, a KP. Now, the strategy to use for a key player is to keep them close. And that means that the organization, in this case, LJ, LWJ, should keep in regular communications with BG. So we know here it is kept close. Let's write that in quickly. Kept close. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to our second criteria, which is the newly hired construction workers should be. Well, we know they've taken on some temporary employees. We know the project's lasting 18 months. So they're there for a fairly long time, actually. So presumably they're going to have quite a lot of interest in the company. But of course, they're not going to have a lot of power because they've only just been at the company and they're construction workers rather than being involved in a managerial role. So they're not going to have a lot of influence on strategy and decision making. So they're going to be low power and probably high interest. Um, with temporary workers, normally you could choose between low interest and high interest. I think just because they're skilled workers and they've got a relatively long contract, we're going to put them in this box here, which is keep informed. Okay, and we can put that same thing there. The more senior permanent workers will probably be in the same category as well, and that's because they've going to have high interest in the company and that's because they've been there a long time but we can see even though some of them have been dissatisfied with the move to working on the castle actually 
nothing's been done about it. So it shows they don't have a lot of power, which is why I put them in the same box. Okay, the local groups and historians, well, we know they've got interest in the project, but they don't have a much lot of power. So again, we're going to go keep informed again. So you can see we have indeed used each approach more than once. And then finally, we've got the local building preservation body. Well, they probably don't have a lot of interest in the project per se, as long as LWJ abide by their rules. So, in fact, because LWJ have to abide by what the building preservation bodies say, we can know that they're going to have a lot of power. So this is the keep satisfied box. But as long as LWJ abide by what they say, then actually they shouldn't show any real interest in the project in a regulatory sense so we can put KS here and we can see that we've used all of these strategies now because this was BG this was keep satisfied keep informed so we haven't used treat with minimal effort which would go in this quadrant and we haven't ignored anyone because they are indeed all stakeholders so that is question three well, there we go. There's your sample question for your E3 objective test videos. Now, as I've already said, there's 17 chapters in our E3 study text. So there's 17 sets or well, the 17 sets of videos, each containing questions about the relevant topics. Now, you'll be delighted to know the first three chapters of E3 are available for free and are waiting for you at www.astranti.com. Com. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you're ex as excited about this product as we are and good luck with your exams.